embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm the Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on our Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Edwin Gonzalez, who is a postdoctoral scientist in Graham Cook's lab in the Department of Chemistry at Purdue University. And he's focusing on advancing analytical chemistry and biothreat detection. Since December 2023, he has been training graduate students in Python for scripting, statistical programming, and machine learning. Uh, Edwin is involved in multivariate analysis of omics data for government projects and mentors students in presenting data to agencies like DHS and DITRA. He has developed an automated data pipeline app for omics data visualization using Python Streamlit library. And with his expertise in analytical chemistry, machine learning, and infectious disease detection, Edward contributes significantly, significantly to research and education in his field. Welcome, welcome, Edwin. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. It's so exciting to get to know you and get to know a little bit about your work. Thanks for having me here, Tommy. Thank you for the invitation. So let's go straight into this. Awesome. Please share your screen with us. I'm going to turn myself off and let you take the spotlight. Okay, perfect. All right, so this presentation today is titled From Healthcare to Chemistry to Data Science. So we're going to dive into a little bit about um, my background and how I got here. So first of all, um, I'm from the southernmost tip of Texas. So let's get this pointer here. Let's see there. So I'm from McAllen, Texas. That's way down over here. This is where I basically grew up. I got my bachelor's of science in clinical laboratory sciences in 2015 from UTRGV or the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And I then worked at a hospital as a medical laboratory scientist generalist for about two years. And then I applied to grad school here at Purdue and then made my way all the way to West Lafayette. So for some of you Midwesterners who love driving around the United States, or just want to know how long it takes to drive from point A to point B. It's about roughly 23 hours, not accounting for, you know, stops, food, whatever. Anyway, the location I'm from is very rich in culture. There's a lot of uh, cultural spillover from Mexico since we're right by the U.S.-Mexican border. It's a really nice place where it's incredibly hot, very humid. But we also have some of the best northern Mexican food in the region. So enough about where I'm from, let's kind of dive into what I did prior to grad school. So I mentioned earlier that I was a medical laboratory scientist in, uh, back in McAllen, Texas after graduating with my bachelor's. So I worked as a medical laboratory scientist, and what that basically is is that we are the ones who actually run blood tests. So these are just some of the different areas in which we work in. So as a generalist, these are areas I rotated through. So one area I rotated through, for example, was hematology. So here I would run a complete uh, blood counts and also make slides and stain them and evaluate the, uh, the cellular morphology of the red cells and the white cells and try to make sure that there is a good correlation between the, the, the quantitative analysis of the blood versus the actual um, qualitative evaluation of the cells. I also did blood banking, which is probably one of my most favorite uh, areas. It is one of the most high stakes departments in the medical lab. So there's zero room for error in this, but is one of the most rewarding and impactful areas um, that, that I think. 
There's also clinical chemistry where we worked with high level of a high level of automation. So here we would run easily within about two hours in the morning, about three to 400 samples. And in a day we could do up to about 1500. Now this is actually a small trauma three hospital. So that's the lowest trauma designation. So for those of you in the West Lafayette area, trauma three hospitals would be, for example, IU Arnett or Franciscan Health in town. But because of the region we're in, we got a lot of samples out of time. So we are probably about double their, their uh, sample volume. And lastly, there was also clinical microbiology, which a lot of this presentation is gonna be based on. So what we're seeing here is actually a grand stain of a, uh, of a positive blood culture. And what we're seeing are cocci and chains, which is indicative of a potential streptococcal infection in the bloodstream. So now that we've kind of gone over what I've done before, let's kind of dive into what this presentation is really about. So first let's start off with biological threats. So biological threats can consist of fungi, bacteria, viruses, or protein toxins. So if you've seen Breaking Bad, ricin is a great example of, you know, a toxin that is considered a biological threat. And whenever anybody comes down with ricin, that raises a lot of alarms. So biological threats uh, can fall under two different categorical systems. One is select agents by the Health and Human Services, and the other is by the CDC, which are categories A, B, and C. We're going to uh, focus more on the CDC as that is my preferred system to designate these organisms or toxins or biological threats. But anyway, um, going briefly over the different potential biological threats, fungi, for example, we can see Candida auris could be, with, could be a potential biological threat. So for those of you who've paid attention to the news in the past few months, Candida auris has been an emerging uh, yeast infection with a high level of antibiotic resistance as well as histoplasma, given that molds, which histoplasma is, can easily be transmitted in the air. For bacteria, some of these you may have heard, so Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, plague, which is caused by Yersinia pestis, and cholera. And for viruses, smallpox, Ebola, Lassa virus, and Hantavirus, smallpox in this list is the only virus that, is not hemorrh that does not cause hemorrhagic fever while Ebola, loss of virus, and hantavirus can cause hemorrhagic uh, episodes. So I mentioned before that um, I like to use the CDC uh, categories for this. So as I mentioned earlier, there are three categories being A, B, and C, where category A is the most um, severe or dangerous types of biological threats, while C is more in terms of emerging pathogens. So they don't occur as often, they're difficult to acquire, but they have potential to be used as a biological weapon. So most importantly is how does someone identify a biological threat? So there is a hierarchical system for doing this, which is considered, which is called the laboratory response network. At the lowest level, we have sentinel labs, which are clinical labs, for example where this is the first point at which a potential biological threat is detected. Once a biological threat is potentially detected, this is escalated to the uh, reference lab. So the animal disease diagnostic lab here at Purdue, which is a biosafety level three uh, laboratory, is a lab that would receive a sample like this for inform confirmatory testing. Now, once a biological threat is confirmed, it is then escalated to a national lab where it is definitively characterized. Now, another issue with the system is that, you know, the common methods for identifying bacteria involve culturing, using PCR, using amino assays. However, in most of these cases, with the exception of PCR, um, these are very time consuming processes, especially if you're going through, you know, different levels of identifying, escalating, ruling in and ruling out and characterizing any of these organisms, you know, to grow an organism, it takes about 24 hours once you've isolated it. So if you're taking this out from like, say, a wound culture, a sputum culture, 
or whatever type of uh, biological sample, you know, you have to culture that first, wait 24 hours, and then from that mixture of bacteria, because, you know, we all have normal flora on our surface of our skin and areas. So we have to be able to isolate out of that and then subculture again to obtain a more pure culture for appropriate testing. The other issue is that this requires a lot of niche expertise, training, education, and more importantly, this does not occur at a point at which a biological threat is identified. A sample is collected, sent out, and then we go through these levels. So quickly, we're gonna go over bacterial membranes as you know, much of the analysis involved in this is looking at lipids that are within the bacterial membrane. So bacteria are broadly broken down into three different um, bacterial uh, membrane categories, which is gram-negative, gram-positive, and mycobacteria. So gram-negative involves having this lipid bilayer that you see here, uh, separated by a thin peptidoglycan layer suspended in a periplasmic space. And then there's another uh, cell bi bilipid layer. In gram-positive, we have this incredibly thick peptidoglycan layer followed by a uh, lipid bilayer, and there's some lipotechoic acids and tachoic acids that are anchored within this uh, membrane and can extend out. And lastly, for mycobacteria, mycobacterial uh, membranes are more complex, which involve mycolic acids, glycolipids, arabinogalactins, peptidoglycan, and of course the bilipid uh, uh, layer here. And this complexity in uh, membrane here for mycobacteria actually gives uh, this bacteria a very, very stable uh, bacterial membrane. So they're very difficult to actually uh, lyse. Focusing back on uh, some of the gram negatives. So in most cases, gram negative organisms are actually considered pathogenic. So to define it more clinically, when a organism when a gram-negative organism is identified from a wound culture, or is at least, um, or at least, will correlate with the clinical picture and symptoms, um, they're almost always considered pathogenic. Now, that isn't to say that some bacteria that are part of our microbiota that are gram-negative aren't pathogenic. Um, some of them are part of us, and that's fine. It's only when other gram-negative organisms come and suppress that, micro, uh, that microbiota and cause infection, even if it's the same type. For example, different serotypes of, of uh, E. coli, such as O157H7, which causes uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, can actually overpower our own uh, natural E. coli within the gut and cause infection and disease. Now, lipid structures are very important in all life, both mammalian and bacterial. So the ones in the boxes are really the, the classes we're mostly focusing on throughout this presentation. Now, what's important about phospholipids is that they facilitate transmembrane protein structure. They can act as signaling molecules, as in the case of phosphatidyl and acetals, where phosphorylation at each of these um, OH sites here can actually act as uh, as site-specific um, uh, signaling uh, functionalities. And they can also help maintain structure at different temperatures that these bacteria or even our own cells are exposed to. Now to briefly go over what a phospholipid really is. So a phospholipid has a functionality here. So let's look at phosphatidylethanolamine. So we have this ethanolamine group here, followed by this phosphate here or this phosphate head. And then we have the two lipid tails that come off of this. Now moving forward, we're gonna go over how these lipids are analyzed by MS. So, or mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry is used in analyzing proteins, um, lipids, metabolites, and it has been used for many, many years given because owing to its sensitivity and um, specificity. 
So separations are commonly used in uh, mass spectrometry because most uh, samples are considered complex mixtures and complex mixtures can be anything. So say like environmental samples, plasma, urine. So those are examples of, um, of complex mixtures. Now, in order to analyze complex mixtures or just molecules in general with mass spectrometry, we have to ionize them. So there are different ionizing uh, methods or ionization methods, such as paper spray ionization, in which we will apply a sample directly to a filter paper cut to a straight point. We will add solvent, and then we apply a potential, a high potential to, and then that generates droplets. And within these droplets, as they undergo um, Coulombic fission, or what, basically what that means is that they carry so much electrical charge that they explode into secondary droplets. And then this cascading effect occurs until you get what are called dry ions. We also have nanoelectric spray, in which we insert a electrode into this pulled glass capillary tip, add our sample into it, and then apply potential. And then the same process that I just occurred, that I just uh, described occurs. And then there's also imaging by uh, DESI MS, where we can actually use a gas jet followed by a um, a nebulized solvent, which also carries a high potential. It then uh, lands on the surface here, generates secondary droplets, and then goes to the mass spectrometer for mass analysis. And we can actually image the spatial distribution of different ions that are mass analyzed. So I explained how to generate precursor ions to analyze lipids, but we also need to go over how to analyze the structure. So a powerful technique that mass spec provides is known as tandem mass spectrometry or MSMS. So this is one organization of a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, but this is a really good way to kind of understand what is going on in MSMS. So a product ion scan, which is one of the most common MSMS methods that are used, we will fix, say, or select a precursor ion. We will then collide it with a neutral gas or excite it. And uh, then we scan out the products that occur. So once these precursor ions collide with the uh, neutral gas, they pick up internal energy and then they undergo fragmentation, which is what's occurring here. We can also do a precursor scan where we scan out all of the precursors, do, uh, do collision with a neutral gas, and then fix for a specific fragment. And then we return with a mass spectrum of all the precursors that are associated with this one fragment. We can also do a neutral loss where we scan a synchronously fragment and we look at all ion pairs with the same mass to charge difference. And then lastly, we do we can also do multiple reaction monitoring where we fix for a specific precursor and we fix for a specific fragment, which kind of increases our sensitivity after colliding with a neutral gas. Now, one thing to note about how to read um, uh, mass spectra is that our x-axis will always be our mass to charge and our y-axis will be either absolute intensity counts or relative intensity. And what relative intensity means is that the values um, on the y-axis are normalized to zero to 100, which kind of makes it a little easier to read sometimes. Now, now that I've gone over all of these scans, if we were to combine all this data and plot it onto a two-dimensional plot, we can actually return what's called the 2D MSMS data domain, which would contain neutral loss uh, scan information, precursor ion scan information, product ion scan information. And if you were to imagine that there is a, si a single signal here, that would be our multiple reaction monitoring um, uh, data there as well. So to dive quickly into the work that I'm doing, or done rather, um, as Tommy mentioned, I worked on government projects that are funded by DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as uh, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. However, for this presentation, we are only focusing on the work 
that was funded by DHS. So this is a multi-year project. We were given four years to kind of accomplish the goal. And very briefly, the goal here is to design a system that can collect air samples, impact them onto a filter paper. And if a biological threat is detected, we can analyze the biological material on that filter paper right at that same space and provide a, a presumptive identification of a biological threat if it happens to be a true biological threat. So one of the major stopping points of this project was breaking the spores open. So um, by spores, I'm referring to bacillus anthracis. Bacillus anthracis, or early bacillus and clostridia in general, when they are stressed and um, and they identify that the local environment is not ideal, they begin to undergo what's called sporulation. And when they undergo sporulation, they begin to break down the uh, lipid bilayer of theirs. They start to coat it with uh, proteins and glycans. And they also begin to dehydrate the inner part of the core, which contains uh, the DNA. So when it dehydrates the core of the DNA, it also upregulates this the biosynthesis of this molecule here, known as DPA. And that DPA complexes with calcium in the core. And in doing so, it displaces the water. So it makes the core very resistant to not just water, but also UV radiation. Now, there are some pretty obvious targets for analyzing spores. So one is looking at proteins, since the code of the, pro of the spore is made up of a lot of proteins as well. Another is using nucleic acids, so where we can use um, genetic material and run PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, and um, provide an identification from that. But an issue with looking at those is that it requires a lot of sample processing, a lot of clean space in the case of PCR, and it can take a while as well. So there are ways to break open spores, such as using an autoclave, using hot acids, or, or uh, pyrolyzing them, putting them in a mini furnace and burning them at 400 degrees Celsius. But the problem with each of these is that some of these involve germinating them, so making them highly infectious again, or they change the chemical composition to a point where it makes it difficult to analyze. So one method or one approach we took was actually using microwaves. So it had been previously reported that nucleic acids can be detected from microwaves, uh, from a microwaving method where the spores are suspended in water, microwave for short periods of time. However, uh, lipids and DPA were not reported. So this was a strategy we took. Um, so simply what we did is that we made up a, a mixture of ethanol and water, mixed it, put into a glass uh, uh, LC vial, microwaved it for one minute, and then pelleted out the, the cellular debris and then analyzed the supernatant. And from that, we were actually able to see uh, lipid profiles of the spores, the vegetative bacteria, and also the DPA within the spores, which is a, a really important aspect of this. So we did an optimization study for this where we did a series of, of ethanol to water from 0% water to 100% water. And as we see here, we achieve a maxima of the signal of DPA at, um, at about 55% ethanol and water. And what we are monitoring here is this uh, product ion, which is mass to charge 122 in the negative ion mode. Now, I already mentioned that this is a pretty that the that the methods of analysis for these spores takes a while, and this is pretty much why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we load it up, we analyze it very quickly, and we get our answer right away that it is a, that that this sample contains DPA and it is a spore. What was more important is that we were able to observe lipid profiles. So what we're seeing here is a lipid profile of Bacillus subtilis. And we identified four major lipids here. 
So, or, or let me rephrase that, for uh, lipids at really the most uh, simplest level. So what we see here are ions for PG290, 30, 31, 0, and 32, What this basically means is that the number here, the 29, refers to the amount of carbons between the two of uh, fatty acid chains, and the zero here will refer to unsaturation sites or the amount of double bonds that would be present. So in this case, all of the lipids are saturated and contain no double bonds. So one of the reasons this finding was incredibly important is because as we were able to detect DPA here, what this information tells us is that our sample contains spores, but it doesn't tell us um, it does not tell us whether the sample is a, of a specific species or not. So moving forward, we're going to really focus on the lipid profiling capabilities. So one technique that we have in the Cook's lab is two-dimensional tandem mass spectrometry. So this is utilizing a linear ion trap. So the data here was all collected on a linear ion trap. Uh, mass spectrometer. However, in this data or moving forward here, we've modified this instrument to be able to do mass analysis of all precursor ions in a trapped ion population and do MSMS on each of those ions within a one second uh, scan time. So we saw this earlier, which is the uh, which is the two D MSMS data domain. And in the data we're collecting here, we can actually construct the 2D MSMS data domain within this one second here. Um, so for example, on our right-hand side here, we see a lipid profile of Staphylococcus aureus. And this is a, a lipid profile of Staphylococcus aureus, where we're seeing the different uh, phospholipids in this, uh, in this extract. And here we can actually return the data that we would normally see in a regular or data that is acquired on a commercial instrument that is not uh, modified. Uh, we can also capture the MSMS data as well. So if we were to sum all of this data and project it onto this uh, x-axis, um, we return this uh, mass spectrum. And if we were to just take a single line of these uh, product ion scan lines, we can return the uh, the product ions for each of these. And then this is just for comparison with the uh, conventional mass spectrum. So one of the major uh, milestones of this project was determining if we could leverage this technology to provide a identification of some sort which yes, we were able to do. So the scan time here in total was 12 seconds because we averaged uh, 10 averages and the scan time in this specific experiment was 1.2 scans per second. Now what we are doing here is that because we we modified the instrument, we can also ma modify our scans where we can mass analyze one region one lower mass region and obtain uh, metabolite data. And then we can also mass analyze a higher mass region and obtain lipid profiling uh, information. So the two sets of spectra, or rather the two uh, organisms that are analyzed here are Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus thuringiensis. And what's important to note here is that in the spores, we're able to observe DPA. And when we mass analyze the vegetative cells, that DPA signal is completely gone. What is also important is that the lipid profile is mostly retained between the sporulated and vegetative states. And when we an mass analyze another organism, in this case, Bacillus thuringiensis, the lipid profile is not only retained um, or conserved between the sporulated and vegetative states, but they are also completely different from Bacillus subtilis, which basically tells us that we're able to um, not only get information that is binary in the sense of, is this organism a spore or not, or is there a spore 
in the sample or not. But if there is a spore in the sample, um, we can provide a presumptive identification based off of that lipid profile. And there's some machine learning work towards the end of this, which we'll kind of explore. So this is more data on, on the uh, lipid profiling capabilities and the flexibility of the two-dimensional tandem-mass spectrometry method, or 2DMSMS. So I'll start calling it that for short. All of these spectra are in the negative ion mode because um, a lot of the profiling, uh, a lot of these uh, different profiles we obtain are actually pretty nice in the negative ion mode and are strikingly different across organisms. And again, we'll see that later. And as I mentioned before, we're also able to recover a lot of the mass spectra um, that I showed before. There we go. And of course, this is additional data. So in the slide before, I showed you mass spectra, where we're projecting the data, summing and projecting it onto the, onto the x-axis. But this data here is actually the MSMS data. So we're able to get all of the structural information from the 2D MSMS data domain, kind of like how I showed earlier. Now, one of the points that I want to drive home with this is that is that in the other methods with the conventional um, or unmodified instrument, we were kind of able to, can, to uh, acquire some of the same information. However, it's not nearly on the same time scale because I have to you know, select the ion, change the method, record the data, save it, and then move on to the next ion and you know, do this uh, multiple times. With 2 MSMS, we're able to just you know, ionize the sample, collect it within our however many over how many collect data over how many over however many average averages um, and then return the data right away. So we cut down on a lot of the time for this. And again, and I can't stress this enough, it provides a lot of information that we can leverage for machine learning. So going into our machine learning um, uh, topic here. So this is a 2D MSMS spectrum of Citrobacter frundii, which is a gram negative rod and can be found in some wound cultures, especially in, uh, uh, as, especially as a UTI. And this is just some of the data that we're able to acquire from this to just kind of go over and reiterate it. So this is the overall lipid region of the 2D MSMS data domain. Here's the projected data that we can obtain of all these different ions. And then these are the extracted product ion spectra for each of these um, uh, signals that are, or you know, product ion lines that are shown in the red boxes. So now that I've covered you know, breaking open, uh, breaking opening these spores, as well as you know the profiling capabilities of 2D MSMS. Another milestone of this was like, okay, you can generate all this data along along with the structural information of, you know, all the ions that are detected, but can you use that data for machine learning? And the absent and the answer to that was absolutely. So, we looked at two completely different. Uh, data pipelines for this or methods for this. So we looked at machine learning models that can easily be constructed in in uh, scikit-learn using Python, as well as a convolutional neural network. And there's reasons for you know using these two different strategies. So at least for the machine learning aspect of this, which involves this uh, figure here, you know we extract the lipid region from the 2D MSMS data domain. We flatten it and then normalize it using the standard normal variant method, or also known as z-scaling. And the reason we have to flatten it is because most of the scikit-learn libraries take data as vectors, so they won't—they're not compatible with data in this 2D uh, matrix format. So that's why we have to um, flatten it. We then, after organizing this, we slid it up into a 70% training set, 30% testing set, 
With the training set, we, we uh, compress with PCA and LDA or principal component analysis and um, linear discriminant analysis. And the reason we do that is because if you think about it, you know, this is a about 130 by 112 data matrix. When once we unravel that into a single dimension or a one by n uh, vector, that is about roughly 20,000 features. So we need to reduce the dimensionality of that, of that, which is what we do here. Now, in this step here, in the dimensionality reduction process, we generate a PCA and LDA model object. With those objects, we then compress the testing set. Now, the reason we do that, we split then compress with this uh, training set uh, model here is because if we were to compress the uh, data set here at this stage, then technically the model has seen the, uh, the data beforehand, like by proxy. And that is something we don't want because then it gives us more um, more positive outcomes than than are actually you know true. So from this, we take the training set and we will train it with these three models here, which is the random forest model, the k-nearest neighbors model, and the multilayer perceptron. And we do this over a stratified uh, 10k-fold cross validation. Now, what's not really shown here that I do have to stress is that the approach we took to uh, training these models was a brute force approach. So we needed to not just you know, go and train these models and say, okay, we're good with the default values, but we also had to do a combinatorial approach of go iterating through multiple hyperparameters of each of these models and settings and make sure that we can find the most optimal and efficient um, parameters that are that you know lower the computational cost of this. So once these have been trained, we use the testing set, which none of the which none of the uh, models have seen yet, and then we validate it for predicting, you know, these any of these organisms uh, for uh, uh, testing to see if from the data we can accurately predict the the organisms at the species level. So th these are lipid profiles of the organisms we looked at. So I know I didn't label these here, so I'll just go ahead and um, repeat these out uh, verbally. So this is a, all of these are na in the negative ion mode. So this is for Bacillus subtilis. This is a profile of Bacillus thurigenesis, Citrobacter um, frundii, Citrobacter coseri. This is Enterococcus fecalis. This one is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This one's Staphylococcus aureus, and then Staphylococcus capitis. And then here is the multivariate statistical analysis of these uh, of these organisms. So each of these data points refers to a biological and technical replicate that was collected with the in with the instrument. And what we're doing here on this plot here that is known as a scree plot, I am plotting the explained variance ratio in percent against the number of principal components. So what we're doing here is we are trying to find out at which point our explained variance plateaus, and then we select those that amount of uh, principal uh, components for uh, the machine learning models and you know, further compression with linear discriminant analysis. And the reason we did this three times was to look at different uh, normalization strategies. So this is the data without normalization. This is the data by normalizing by the maximum intensity in each spectrum. And then this is the uh, normalized data using the standard normal variant method. And what the standard norm normal variant method does is that it scales the data by centering the mean of the data at zero with a standard deviation of one. And the standard normal variant method is the method that we chose for the machine learning approach. So here we have all of the machine learning data, which provides, uh, which as we can see here, has excellent um, classification uh, results here in this confusion matrix. Now, here are the accuracies for each of the um, models that were explored. 
as well as the area under the curve for the receiver operator characteristic analysis. Now, basically what that is is that we're looking at the false positive rate of this. So a uh, area under the curve or you know the area that's measured here, if it's one that is telling us that this, um, that the prediction capabilities of this are actually very, very good and would provide little to no uh, false positives. Now, if you were to see notches in, in this or where, um, or where the, the graph is not like an even elbow here, then that's where we start seeing that the model is having some difficulty in classifying the organisms. Now, the receiver operator curve analysis is used differently depending on you know the needs of the of the person or the data scientist who is looking to um, to evaluate their models. So the strategy I took was assessing the prediction capabilities of the model against each um, microorganism individually. So what that basically means is that I'm taking a strategy called one versus rest. So for example, it's taking all of the bacillus organism as one class, uh, bacillus subtilis organism as one class, and then, it regroup, and then it groups the remainder as a completely different class altogether. And then it goes through doing this for every single organism. And then here's just some more uh, metrics on uh, the prediction capabilities of the models with each of the organisms. Now, we also looked at convolutional neural networks for classification. So the reason we looked at this is because if you look at the 2D and SMS data domain, so I'm gonna to go to a previous slide so we can get a good picture of this. Um, it looks basically like an image. It, it, essentially, it is an image of product ion scan, of product ion spectra where our um, x-axis here is our precursor ion master charge, which is one dimension, our product ion uh, master charge along the y-axis is another dimension, and the third dimension, or the intensity of the color here, is the, is the intensity of that specific ion. So convolutional neural networks uh, fall under the category of deep learning and are very computationally intensive and expensive, but they have very superb um, capabilities in image analysis. So, you know, if we treat this data as an image, then our, our reasoning here is, you know, this should be uh, uh, compatible for using with the convolutional neural network. So what we did here is that we imported the raw 2D MSMS data, we calibrated it to make sure the axes were correct. And this was over 432 different spectra and there's eight different organisms. So there's 54 um, different uh, spectra for each of these organisms. We went ahead and then used min-max normalization. And what that basically means is that all of the data points in terms of intensity will lie between zero and one. And then we augmented the data by the addition of random intensity and mass shifts. So one issue with 2D MSMS is that, well, with ion traps in general, is there's a phenomenon that's called space charging. So if you have too many ions in your trap, this can actually cause mass shifting. So in a uh, unmodified instrument, you can actually see your mass either increase or decrease, your mass accuracy, sorry, um, uh, deteriorate because of space charging. And this can cause your, your uh, ions to actually be you know, several units uh, higher than they actually are. And in 2D MSMS, this is a, a, it is very sensitive to that. So if in cases where we are either using too few ions or too many ions that can actually mass that can actually shift our masses over, um, you know, to the right or to the left or down or up. And in the case of the machine learning um, aspect of this project, you know, that would actually be uh, an issue, right? 
because you know if we're shifting the positions then of the data then you know our models are going to think it's a completely different sample and could misclassify um, any of these uh, bacteria so by utilizing convolutional neural networks this is actually not a problem so we tested that out by doing this augmentation so we increased our spectra or the quantity of our spectra from 432 to 2700 different spectra we did our same uh training test splitting 70 30 training testing and then we trained our convolutional neural network now um, as i mentioned before these uh experiments these uh these convolutional neural networks are intensely uh are computationally expensive, sorry. So we really looked at um, one, one main point of optimization and that was using epics. So this is kind of like a, uh, in brief, an epic is just a, how many times the, the data is being extruded through the neural network uh, during training. So um, with one epic, which takes about 15 minutes to train, we see the classification is really not that good. And then after going up to five, 10, and 15, the performance is at its most perfect. And all of these uh, all of the data are, uh, in terms of uh, percent accuracy are normalized to a value of one. But we decided to go with five epics because it's the least amount of time to train. And you know, once we start getting into higher epics, um, it's not really necessary. But of course, if we start increasing the amount of bacterial species, then we may need to increase the amount of epics and kind of find our sweet spot. There we go. We're almost getting to the end of this. So Really, the future outlook of 2D MSMS have kind of shown, you know, its capabilities in analyzing biological samples and machine learning, and as well as its implications in data science, is the, the future of this now is going to be really high throughput. So coupling uh, DESI or desorption electrospray ionization with 2D MSMS, where we can apply these biological samples onto a sample plate, raster over with DESI, and then analyze mass analyze these with 2D MSMS. And in doing so, we can actually look at, you know, hundreds or thousands of samples and obtain, you know, this large amount of data at the same time. Now, high throughput experimentation is not new. It's something that the Cooks group also does a lot with, um, with commercial instruments, but we're starting to make progress into pushing this forward over to 2D MSMS. So, you know, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned. And, you know, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to any of us in the Cooks group. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Edwin. I don't know what happened to your video. I can't see you anymore for some reason. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I think I might have accidentally cut it. That's my bad. I didn't realize that. Uh, that's all right. But thank you so much, Edwin Gonzalez from the chemistry department and Graham Cook's lab. Thank you for giving us that incredible view of uh really where we are at with analytical chemistry and and 2D MSMS type uh, data analysis. So interesting and so wonderful uh, to see it advance. Were you able to uh, do your uh, do your video? Hmm? Oh, Were yes, yes, yes. Turn okay, on your video? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, there we go. There we go. So yeah, so thanks so much. But tell us a little bit, what got you interested at, from the beginning in this area? Well, what's, uh, what's your, like, what, what drives you to continue to work? And maybe what was the uh, first inclination that you wanted to do analytical chemistry? 
So um, when I was doing my bachelor's, I did my minor in chemistry. And because of a miscommunication advisement, I ended up having to take um, a lot of chemistry coursework in the very beginning when I started. So um, I didn't take any of my biology prerequisites for my degree until like my second year. I see. And when I did, I think the first semester I did that, I took no chemistry courses and it was probably the most depressing semester. I, I loved the learning style. I loved, you know, learning about the finer things in life rather than, you know, at a macro level with biology. So um, that was one of those things. And then, you know, that's when I decided to really go for chemistry. But uh, there's other things behind it and I don't want to draw it out too long. But in short, you know, I wanted to go into healthcare. I found out I really liked the natural sciences more, you know, came into natural sciences really late in my degree. And then due to time and funding, went back to healthcare. Um, but in doing so, I took a lot of chemistry courses and one of those was instrumental analysis. And as we covered a lot of the different instrument uh, techniques, because I did research in an organic synthesis lab, okay. you know, Graham and I sort of had the same epiphany. So if you know about Graham, uh, you know, he found out he really did not like doing columns. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. So when we came over mass spec, I was like, wow, we could like get all of the structural information from complex mixtures and I don't have to do a column. So that, that kind of stuck with me. And when I went into healthcare, I started seeing a lot of like, you know, the translation of basic science to an actual like, you know, application where we're actually using it to help people. So, you know, this experience, you know, from undergrad to postgrad work um, heavily influenced a lot of what I'm doing. Nice. Nice. That's great. And so where do you where do you want to take it what do you where do you see yourself in the next five years so i actually see myself still working in the uh bio threat detection space i've accepted a position with teledyne clear nice. they are our collaborators who we've worked with in uh, dhs heavily so i probably should have mentioned that but shout out to clear <laughs> teledyne clear awesome. teledyne um but uh, I see myself moving more into the data science aspect of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I came in with absolutely no programming experience or advanced mathematics or, you know, I mean, when you think about it, I was very much a fish out of water when I started my graduate career, right? Um, so it was quite the challenge. And what really drove me to go more into data science was actually failure. So we take a course known as uh, Advanced Analytical Chemistry or Chem 621, which is kind of like a statistics and chemistry and chemometrics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the first course I've ever had to repeat um, in my entire academic career. So that's what really motivated me to learn more and kind of apply it into, um, into my work. That's awesome. So out of the challenge came the persistent pursuit to overcome the challenge and now you love it oh absolutely i i absolutely love it and it was it was a very intense um i put myself through an intense gauntlet to get myself to this point so uh, for those of you who are from purdue or grad students um there is a very short five six course data science uh, uh primer that you can take and it's uh, six different courses, one credit each. I took about five of them in a summer and it was intense, but you know, I learned everything that I needed to learn to get up to this point and really develop that, that uh, way of thinking that it, when it comes to programming, right? Because when you think about programming, you're instructing a computer to do something and you have to be very explicit about each of those steps. Yes. Yes, it can't do much thinking on its own. <laughs> or Exactly. That is absolutely right. Well, Edwin Gonzalez, thank you so much for taking time to be our lecturer for the Purdue Lecture Hall series today and uh, wishing you all continued success and all the best in your future endeavors. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too, Tommy. Thank you very much for this. All right. Have a good one. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.
Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.